Hello and welcome to Cover Story. Today we have with us BJP leader Ram Madhav. He's in charge of Jammu and Kashmir. He's also a member of the RSS National Executive, and of course, he is the president of the India Foundation. Ram Madhav ji, it's good to have you back here for a conversation after a very long time, I must say. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I should begin with congratulating you about the Jammu and uh, Kashmir results, or only the Jammu results. I <laughs> know uh, you must uh, congratulate. Uh, the government the election commission for conducting jammu and kashmir elections so transparently so peacefully i would say you have heard some complaints although silly complaints about elections that happened around the same time in haryana yeah. but not a single complaint from anybody about jammu and kashmir <laughs> good point i didn't think of that <laughs> so that shows that uh, the election was conducted with utmost uh, you know uh, transparency very peacefully Uh, the state administration uh, headed by also the LG also shows Congress also. had no states in JNK. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, it's a good election for us. It's a wonderful victory. Also, we secured highest vote share in the state. Not only highest among the parties, of course, we are the uh, largest uh, vote taker, but also largest in BJP history. Also, largest share of twenty six percent vote. so it's quite a good result for us in jammu and kashmir it's another matter that uh, at the end of the day nc managed to secure enough seats to form a coalition government or uh, good wishes to them another matter or a very important matter because this is the first election after 370 and you know the, the revocation of statehood so what does it say on that narrative so no, it's as usual a very split mandate uh, valley went for uh, nc Jammu largely went for BJP, and you know, uh, Congress could not get a single seat in the heartland of Jammu. Mm. Managed to just win one Muslim-dominated seat in the hills of Jammu, and similarly, NC could not win any seat in the heartland. Managed to win a few seats in the hills of Jammu, where Muslim popular Muslim voters are more in number. So Jammu, in a way, sided with BJP. Valley sided. fully with uh, nc it's again a very split mandate not exactly the same as the one in 2014 mm. but more on the same lines you know if you recall 2014 was also a similar kind of vote except that this time with the help of independents and the congress party nc managed to secure the required majority but jammu heartland remains absent in the uh, political uh, arrangement there which is why perhaps the cm has now you know begun the tradition of moving to jammu for the winter and uh, you know other steps are being taken but you know the divisive mandate is something that the bjp has always been accused of divisive politics so jammu also is in a way a picture of that no if we accuse bjp for this mandate we should accuse nc also nc could only win in kashmir they could not win in jammu means they jammu has rejected them hmm. So it's not like that. I I did not use the divisive mandate. I said it's a split verdict. Uh, I use divisive because uh, yes, uh, it's a split let's verdict. Let's call it what it is. Hmm. Uh, the issues were different. Uh, Jammu went with the national mood that we don't agree with the demand of the national conference that 370 should be revoked. Uh, so Jammu solidly went uh, with the national mood, supported the BJP. Uh, valley i don't really think went with the nc because of 370 then it may be because they wanted to assert uh, a, a very important issue that you know Jam- our state should be ruled by us mm. it has been it is being ruled for last many years by you know uh, under uh, under president so it is being ruled by people not from jammu and kashmir maybe they wanted to assert that aspect because you know see interestingly 370 was the topmost agenda item for them in their manifesto for the nc i'm talking about but on the very day of the results the leader uh, mr omar abdullah openly said it's not our priority uh, another matter that he uh, one can say he deceived the voters but that's the not the issue there was no reaction meaning people also genuinely probably thought that this is not the priority we need our government that is the priority which is the reason perhaps why mehbooba mufti failed to take off because she made it no she a more radical why campaign why one failed to take off one has to do their own uh, introspection but, but if you, you are, ask me from yes outside, because you are also an analyst i would say the the decline of uh, 
of PDP in the valley is, uh, I think, due to the kind of family politics practiced by Mehbooba Mufti. Uh, not necessarily because, uh, uh, because of other reasons, but more because, you know, it has become a party of just one uh, family. Even then, they secured some vote percentage, 8 percent of votes. Uh, yes, decline, definitely. But uh, they have to introspect. As I said, out, from outside, we should not uh, comment about their internal matters. But how do you see Omar progressing? You know, he's been, uh, he passed a resolution, but he worded it very carefully, saying we were concerned about the removal of special status. It not, it wasn't a very, you know, hard-hitting resolution. Uh, how do you see him progressing as a CM? And is he the right man for the position, uh, for the times? Oh, people voted for his party. His party elected him uh, as chief minister. So there is no... There is no need for any debate over whether he is the right man that po for that position or not. Whoever uh, is uh, pro given the mandate, he will rule. He or she will rule the state. But more importantly, on the issue of that resolution, I would say, uh, I mean, uh, the NC tried to be over smart in that. How? They did not use the word 370 just to, just to probably deceive people in the rest of the country. But actually, the content of the resolution was about special status, about the rights they existed, about the identity. More importantly, mm -hmm. what is it? What is? What does it mean? Special status, identity, uh, the rights existed before. What does it mean? Means you are asking for three seventy and thirty five year to be returned. So it is a very deceptively worded uh, resolution, but very much wanting to take the state back to pre-2019 status. That's why our party stood very firmly uh, against uh, the moving of the resolution. Although, you know, in assemblies and parliaments, huh. resolutions don't matter anything. It's only bills and acts that matter. A resolution is okay, you pass any resolution in the house, hmm. even if you have the majority, you okay. pass it. So you're saying How it does it matter? Just paying How lip service. It, uh, it's only to, and first of all, to deceive the rest of the country in a way, but also deceiving his own people. Just pass a resolution and uh, wash off your hands. Hmm. It's not, it's not constitutionally, it's just a piece of paper. But uh, moving on, you know, BJP has always, uh, you don't rest. You know, once election is over, you're already planning for the next one. So what are you doing about Kashmir? How do you win back the people of the valley? Uh, the, in this election, especially as far as uh, BJP is concerned, we have seen definitely a lot of change in the mood, in the valley I am talking about. You know, I have been, uh, you know, visiting that state for many, many months, uh, sorry, many, many years. Uh, I was active uh, during the 2014 election campaign also. But when we used to go for campaigns, rallies mm -hmm. in, the, in the towns and cities of valley, we used to get 500 people. 300 people in the audience. Whereas this time, I went to one place, I found almost 5,000 people in my, my public program. Another place in South Kashmir, heart uh, of uh, you know separatist politics, there I found three to 300,000 people attending and listening to what we are saying very attentively. And when we talked about Prime Minister Modi's development and welfare programs, there was huge applause. So, definitely the appetite to listen to us has increased Okay. and we secured relatively better votes this time. In fact, in one seat in the valley, we lost by about 1100 votes. In another seat in South Kashmir, our candidate secured almost 7000 votes. Mm. I mean, it is unimaginable for us. You know, these numbers may look uh, very small for the rest of the country, but in Kashmir, they are very big numbers. So, I think that mood in uh, Kashmir Valley is definitely changing. First of all, 370 is no longer the central issue for people of Kashmir. Hmm. Probably good government, their own government. I would uh, uh, like to say that any state will have that sentiment. If you put a state under pressure, it's a lot of compulsion, not because center wanted it, but there was a situation. But after four years, five years, the state, people of the state would want their own government. Those urges are what they what exist, and on the statehood, granting statehood is the demand even BJP supports. Supports, but hasn't yet implemented. Despite the Supreme Court uh, saying that giving you a no, time. It will like happen. Uh, Honorable Prime Minister has openly promised to people during the election campaign. Promises and resolutions, happen. you know, so it's not these a bill. things. 
uh, you know, it's a new status to be granted. By the way, you probably should know that it's not something that uh, can be simply restored okay. statehood because the state that existed before 2019 uh, no longer not. exists now. It's a totally different geography, different uh, kind of uh, setup you have. For this, a new status has to be extended. Right now, as UT, it is uh, under the constitutional article that is applicable to Pondicherry. Hmm. So, we can't make it, uh, we have to make it a different kind of, uh, granted a different kind of statehood with different sets of powers. You know, in India, like Delhi is a state, it enjoys different kinds of powers. So, what kind of powers Jammu Kashmir should, should enjoy when it uh, is granted statehood will be debated and discussed and uh, decided by the parliament. It has to pass through that uh, the process, which has not okay. Yes. that is an interesting point. But uh, one last thing, you know, we've also heard uh, speculation about a change of guard from the center in the state, you know, in the uh, in the Union Territory. Talk about you going as governor. <laughs> <laughs> what have you? Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, there will be lots of rumors, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, these are all administrative decisions. There is no no reason to speculate about them. Uh, when uh, the government decides uh, there is any need for change because right now the state is running smoothly, uh, efficient administration, uh, now there is an elected government also is in place. So, whenever such decisions have to be taken, they will be taken at an appropriate time by the government and these are administrative decisions, why should one speculate about them? If it is a political thing, uh, it is a different matter. But about administrative decisions, about governors, appointment of them, it is purely the prerogative of the Prime Minister and the government. Okay, before I also wanted to talk to you about the recent Trump win and the impact it has. I've noticed you've written a couple of columns also on it. Uh, but just a quick curiosity, how was it for a, you know, someone uh, from the South to go to, um, you know, and a hardcore RSS man? How did your first, uh, you know, ventures in the valley, how were you, you know, how to get acceptance, how to make bonds and contacts? How was it? Yeah, it's a part of our country. Uh, whether you are looked, where, where you are looked at with great suspicions, <laughs> where the RSS no, and the BJP is. To, I have been going to Kashmir Valley for more than 20 years now. I worked there even in RSS. I used to go and I have lots of good friends there. And when I became the general secretary of the party, I handled that important responsibility of forming the coalition government right. between BJP and PDP. It was during that time that I have um, been able to build the good rapport with a number of leaders across this party spectrum. Uh, so, thankfully, today I have uh, many uh, acquaintances, many good friends in uh, Kashmir Valley also, cutting across uh, party spectrum. I mean, if you want to ask me how come an RSS man is doing, yes. that's precisely what an, an RSS man should do. He should be able to connect with anybody and everybody because ultimately what, is, what does RSS stand for? RSS should stand for one nation, one people. So, I should be able to connect with everybody. Okay. Um, also, now the you know the victory of Donald Trump. Uh, we've been uh, you know a lot has been said about it in the larger message that it sends, especially towards the liberal world. You know, you've written a lot. Uh, I think. I mean, lot more analysis is going to happen about uh, the outcome of American elections. But I think broadly, two three factors influence the outcome. Number one, of course, is economy. Hmm. Despite uh, claims by Biden administration, inflation uh, rates remained extremely high. But I myself have been there for uh, in the last two, three years for at least uh, three, four times. I myself noticed hmm. that there is a spike in you know prices. Everything is costly now. So, definitely salaries have not increased, incomes have not changed. So, there is uh, that issue of uh, economy, of course. But more importantly, I thought, the politics that Biden administration and the neoliberals represented in the last four years, the NGO style government, I mean, uh, all those NGO gangs were all part of the Biden administration. Take the case of India. Those who hated India, participated in protest rallies against India in uh, American campuses, have suddenly become uh, some, uh, some uh, functionary of the administration there. So, extreme liberalism, wokeism, uh, this whole cancel culture and uh, the whole debate about abortions, all these things have put off a large section of 
the Americans. Very interestingly, this is something that I noticed in this election. Uh, Trump has won, of course, majority of the states. Mm. He secured majority in the states. But he won so many such counties which are Latino dominated. Yes. Which are Indian dominated. I mean, in other words, the minority dominated uh, who used to be traditionally the supporters of the Democrats. liberals hmm. are today uh, turning against the liberal uh, politics, especially on the questions of immigration and all. So, bottom line is, I am not at all suggesting that, you know, liberals are finished or whatever. You know, with all great difficulties, America has an inherent sexist problem. You know, for a woman to win an election is not an easy, she, uh, not easy. In the last 250 years, it has not happened in that country. So, in spite of all such challenges, Kamala managed to get almost 48% vote share, mm. which is not small in America. Trump won with 51% vote. So, Republicans are, uh, Democrats are there, the liberal politics is there, but probably they have to really introspect about those left li liberal woke domination of their party. Okay, I'm going to come back on this point, but after a very quick break, so stay with us. Hello and welcome back to our cover story conversation with Ram Madhav. We were talking about uh, JNK but now we are on to uh, Trump and his win. There is also a lot of editorials on the decisive nature of the Trump's campaign. Like at least with Trump you knew where he stood whereas with Kamala Harris there was a lot of ifs and buts. Is that uh, also what works with the voter? Oh, I mean, You may not like it but at least you know where he stands. You know, how you look at it, it all depends on that. So for example, hmm. Since I mentioned about ab abortion, abortion issue, yeah. mm -hmm. let me tell you, on abortion, most, uh, you know, <laughs> I I how I would put it, indecisive stance was that of Trump's. At least Kamala was clear mm -hmm. that I will give full abortion rights to women. Right. That's the liberal, left liberal woke stand. Whatever you want to do, you do with it. There are abortion pills, abortion uh, medication, you use it to your uh, satisfaction. Whatever you want to do, you do it. What Trump did was, the Republicans wanted a no. federal ban on mm. those pills, mm. abortion uh, medication. But Trump said no. And Trump even said no to a federal ban on abortions. Mm. He insisted that I leave it to the states. Mm. So there, in fact, that is one reason that pragmatism of Trump, mm. different from what we saw Trump in 2016 or 2020, yeah. mm. some kind of a pragmatism probably has helped him win a good number of women votes also. So this election requires much more deeper analysis. But as I said, broadly speaking, I would say, one is economy, second is uh, this whole wokeism and extreme liberalism, uh, third is issues like uh, infiltration or illegal migration. Huh. They are the main issues that decided this, uh, this outcome. So how do you see the road ahead under Trump in terms of where India stands, where China stands, where the world stands? Ukraine, let's start with that. I know that uh, many fear uh, that uh, Trump would be a big disruptor. Hmm. We have to wait and see. Trump. Uh, uh, of 2016 and tr Trump of 2024 must be, I think, two different individuals as we talk now. COP uh, 27, hmm. right, 27, is happening in Baku, in Azerbaijan. So there the climate activists are uh, seriously worried because if you recall, in 2017, hmm. uh, one of the very first decisions that Trump took as president was to withdraw from Paris uh, climate protocol. Hmm. And uh, then 2021, Biden re-entered America into that protocol. Yeah. Many people fear that, you know, Trump will again quit uh, Paris protocol and insist that this whole, uh, you know, greenhouse emissions are and all this is a, is a tamasha. It's a bogus thing. But uh, I don't see that happening. So I think Trump must have also learned so many things over the last uh, ten, uh, eight years. And we hope that we will find uh, uh, a different approach on many issues because his first term marked uh, exit of America from many international obligations. Correct. Mm -hmm. I hope that won't be repeated in this term. India, US is a different thing which we should discuss separately. Tell us about India, US and... So for us, uh, you know, for us uh, two things will directly impact us. Mm. One is his policy of tariffs. Mm. Uh, he declared during his campaign that he will 
uh, he will increase tariffs on imports uh, for by about 10 to 20 percent it's mm-hmm. a huge increase huge rise so he probably said it keeping china in mind mm. but when he said it he said it about all countries right so if it comes to us if they start imposing such such uh, you know tariff uh, increases on us how do we handle it we have to und- uh, we have to think about it because if you know india exports a lot to us mm. in fact we have a trade surplus with us so this tax issue will be an issue which we have to face when it comes. I'm sure Prime Minister enjoys, Prime Minister Modi enjoys a very good rapport with Trump. He would be able to explain to President Trump that India's imports hmm. are not job stealers for America. They're actually job creators for America. Contrary huh. to uh, its huh. uh, import, most of our imports huh. are, you know, software imports, software hmm. exports, uh, huh. things like that, that actually create more jobs in that country. Unlike China. China, which imports products uh, that end up... Manufactured goods. uh, Yes. Mm. The second issue that might uh, cause some anxiety here is about uh, H-1B visas. Mm. The visas that our professionals and others get for entry into US. Overall, the policy now for, uh, for... governments in US, not just uh, Trump, even Biden government also was that now you have to create more jobs for your own people. Mm. So put some uh, restrictions on uh, the uh, entry of uh, out, huh. outsiders into the country. Under a Republican regime, they are generally anti-immigration, mm. generally, broadly speaking. So that might also cause some anxiety to us. These are all purely on the bilateral front, I am saying. But on the multilateral front, I would uh, take the risk of making uh, one important uh, you know, assessment of the situation that uh, the global flashpoints two existing flashpoints. One is uh, in Israel, Gaza, and the other is in Ukraine, Right. Russia-Ukraine conflict. In both these conflicts, probably President Trump can work closely with India, with Prime Minister Modi, to probably find a solution to both these conflicts. Uh, if, uh, I mean, if uh, one leader who has very good rapport with uh, leaders of these Both. two hmm. two flashpoints. It is Prime Minister Modi. He enjoys very good rapport with President Putin here, Prime Minister Netanyahu there. So any solution to it, be effort by Trump and uh, Prime Minister Modi together will definitely be, uh, I mean, it will probably yield better results. That's what I feel. Can I add just one more thing on hmm. this issue, India, US? So in our neighborhood, when Trump was president, we used to follow what... Uh, uh, used to be known as uh, India-led approach in mm. the neighborhood. Meaning, in the neighborhood, India's views would be taken seriously by the US administration. There was a, okay. uh, an effort in tandem. Mm. We would work together. That practice uh, was broken during Biden's regime. US administration unilaterally intervened in the affairs of our neighbors, mm. sovereign countries. We have nothing to say. But there will be certain issues on which countries have to work together, especially countries like India and US have to work together, and especially in our neighborhood, whether it is Bangladesh or Sri Lanka or Nepal, uh, on all these issues, probably under a new Trump administration, we would again be able to work in a more coordinated way, in a, in a, in a tandem we can work together uh, with a same vision and approach. What is the, you know, there is also a lot of fear or editorials on the fact that the world is turning right. You know, now again that has come back. We saw it earlier, then it took a rest when Biden and Kamala Harris were there. Now again that debate has come up. Oh, world was, <laughs> on a letter of world was very, very right yeah. before 1947, <laughs> 1945. It turned uh, a little uh, left and liberal after 47. It's turning back in 21st century. Right left is, you know, in a matter of fact way, this mm. right-left whole discourse is uh, very specific to French parliament. At the t- time of the first French revolution, the those who supported uh, the monarch used to sit on the right and those who opposed uh, monarch used to sit on the left. Okay. That's how this right-left That's business started. Rights became conservatives and lefts became the uh, leftist and liberals. Yeah. But uh, we, ap- we apply it in the sense that there is a conservative sentiment that is growing in the world today especially in Europe and also now with the win of President Trump in USA, US also has come back to 
the Republican or conservative ideas. And in uh, in uh, countries like India, parties like BJP always espouse those causes, which can be broadly categorized as conservative. But why should one worry about it? This is a very, very uh, strong ideological position, very well-respected position, which believes in uh, ideas like nationalism, ideas like patriotism, ideas like religion, uh, ideas like family values. Uh, this is one uh, ideological spectrum which believes in these things hmm. as against the liberal approach which, which believes, believes in? Uh, not in society, family and community but individual, not in nationalism but internationalism, uh, not in religion but irreligious or atheistic approach, non-religious approach uh, or which you can categorize as secular approach. Uh, so, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually an ideological division. More and more people are returning to this idea of uh, nation, God, religion, family and values. Okay, I will debate with that with you because you are totally out of time. But I want to also, since I have you here, quick one on the RSS-BJP relationship. You know, we saw initially there was a lot of skepticism. Nadda's comments in the elections didn't uh, go well with the RSS. But now after Haryana, all seems to be well and everything is, you know, back to normal. Oh, firstly... Uh, Nadaji's comments were misrepresented, misinterpreted. He did not say anything in the way it was uh, presented later. Yeah, if you read the full interview, uh, he never meant any such thing. Uh, but that apart, you know, I always say that I am the standing example of the relationship. You know, after Nadaji's so-called you know, controversial statement and all also, I have been uh, sent back from the RSS to the party. So, um, it is two organizations working together. There will be issues that need to be discussed from time to time. But there is no such thing called there is any big division or difference of opinion or gap. They are working separately, now working together. No such thing. Remember, RSS role at the time of elections is limited. Hmm. It is called Lok Jagaran, Jana Jagaran. Huh. So, just awakening the people about real issues of the nation and how they should think while voting. And then, of course, encouraging people to vote, that they will continue to do. Those who do Lok Jagaran, Jana Jagaran, cannot be angry with anybody. So, they are not angry with anybody. Okay. As you said, you are the example of all is well, so no arguments there. But there was, uh, you know, at least uh, one, the perception was that there were some differences. But at least end of the day, as they say, all is well. Thank you so much for this conversation and wish you all the best in your Thank new you ventures. Thank you. Thank you. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon.